Good evening. Welcome to the Earnings Review, your tidbits into company financials and operational insights. Thank you for joining us as we broadcast from Hampton Studios in Harare, Zimbabwe. I'm Ibn Mabunda, yo money man. On the show, we engage top echelon executives to get you up to speed with first-hand information. We also chat with the most competent analysts on the market just to ensure you're finished with relevant and comprehensive market analysis. Tonight, we focus on Delta Corporation as there is a heavyweight and Zimbabwe's largest beverages producer. Let's have a look at some quick facts to understand how the group is organized. Delta is an integrated beverages company that houses various local and international brands in lager beer, traditional beer, as well as sparkling beverages. The entity is also invested in various associates which produce a wide range of beverages including cordials, juices, wines, as well as spirits. Delta also holds Coca-Cola distribution rights as well as bottling rights here in Zimbabwe and is a subsidiary of AB InBev, the world's largest brewer and the owners of the Pepsi brand. Follow me as we take a jog down memory lane to understand how Delta has evolved over the years in Zimbabwe. The group has its roots back to 1898 and has been in operation for over 122 years. In 1898, recent settlers in Salisbury, namely Louis Sussman as well as Adolf Rosenthal, founded an entity that would be known as the Salisbury Lager Beer in Zimbabwe. In 1946, the company went on to list on the local stock exchange as Rhodesia Breweries Limited. In 1950, the new Rhodesian firm went on to establish in Blue Whale, an iconic brewery which would be known as the Sable Brewery. And in 1962, two firms merged, which were the Rhodesian breweries as well as the Anglo American of Rhodesia, resulting in the formation of the Northern Rhodesia Breweries. In 1978, in line with the political developments taking place in the country, this saw the group rebrand into the Delta Corporation. In 1980, a unit was opened which would house the research and development unit and that was known as the Delta Technical Division. Fast forward to the year 2002, the group had grown through mergers and acquisitions at which point the group decided to demerge its hoteling units as well as its supermarket business units to of course focus on the beverages operations. In 2014, the group went on to disband a packaging unit NAMPAC in association with a JSE listed entity and Delta continues to hold a stake in that very firm NAMPAC. Let's look at how it is organized. Delta has three main divisions which are the Delta beverages, the agro-industrial as well as investments in subsidiaries as well as associates. On the agro-industrial front, the group has two plants which, which produce barley as well as sorghum. And on the investments in subsidiaries as well as associates, the group has investments in other entities which further the agenda of the group, particularly where beverages are concerned. And some of the key units in that very arm would be the NAMPAC, which produces packaging equipment, as well as AFTIS, a leading liquor producer in Zimbabwe. Also in the segment is the National Breweries of Zambia, which is listed on the Lusaka Stock Exchange. And there, of course, is is also where you have the strips which houses the Mazoe brand. Let's have a look at Delta Beverages which would be the anchor in terms of revenue generation for the group. You have the Lager Beer which has several iconic brands among them the Castle Lager, Pilsner, Zambezi and the Bollingers among others. Also in the same category is the traditional beer leg which has nine breweries housing among other brands the famous 
Shibuku brand. They also have the sparkling beverages, which as I mentioned earlier, has the Streps housing, the Mazoe, as well as the Coca-Cola brands. They also have two other units, the transport and distribution unit, plus alternative beverages where you find yogurts as well as Maheo. Let's have a look at some of the vital stats in as far as the group is concerned with a current share price of 2,487 cents. The group has a market capitalization of a whooping 30 billion Zimbabwean dollars. The stock has surged 631% since the year started vis-a-vis -a, -vis a top 10 index which has moved over 275%. Comparatively, the ZSE All Share has mounted 650% since the year started. As a caveat, the ZSE is currently under suspension. Its top shareholders would be the AB InBev with a 24% stake, as well as the Reina Incorporated with a 15.2% shareholding in the group. At the top echelon of the organization would be Canon. Uh, um, Dube, who's the group chairman, as well as Pearson Goero, the group chief executive. Some notable recent developments would be the completion of the acquisition of the United National Breweries of South Africa, the owners of the Chibuku brand. This comes, of course, barely two years after the acquisition of the National Breweries of Zambia. This concludes the Halaju section of our show. In just a moment, we'll have an in-depth analysis at the operations of the entity. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back viewers and in this segment we look at the performance of the group Delta and now joining me for conversation with that is concerned is our very own chief analyst at Equity Access, Respect Gwenzi. Respect, good evening and welcome to the earnings review. Thank you Iban, it's always my pleasure. Good evening viewers. Fantastic. Um, now, uh, respect, as we get into the halogens of their performance up to this point, um, this, of course, is coming at a point where economic fundamentals in Zimbabwe are weakening. There's depressed demand across the economy, and uh, we are seeing inflation soaring and a weakening local currency sure. playing out in Zimbabwe. Just in a nutshell, can you give us insight into the situation that we're seeing playing out in this uh, jewel of Africa. Thank you. So I think on a macro scale, uh, we're quite in a mess as an economy. Uh, GDP is actually falling uh, for two key reasons. Uh, firstly, that uh, there's been a, 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 a currency erosion that has been quite steep. So you would know that purchasing power also falls as the value of your currency erodes. So there's been inflationary pressure induced by currency losses. So that means people have to spend or people get to spend less. And likewise, production equally follows suit. And also to maintain a certain levels of production, you need demand, you also need supply, which means you need to source uh, raw materials from outside. And we haven't been able to put together foreign currency to, 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 to import the critical uh, inputs that are necessary for production. So we have had a production crisis which is a supply side issue. We've got had a demand crisis, which is uh, induced by people's salaries being eroded every other single day. So uh, in 2019, the economy realized a minus 10% growth in GDP terms. And for 2020, it could go as up as 15%. So that means the value or the value of what we produce actually uh, uh, um, uh, gets uh, lower in terms of um, in value terms and also in volume, in volume terms. So that really means that the economy is in quite a crisis. But I think underpinning these challenges that the economy is facing is um, uh, a drought that we faced in the prior year. And getting into 2020, we now have COVID issues. And we also have our structural issues, which speak to um, our economy uh, not being fundamentally uh, driven or fundamentally augured, which has driven our currency all. So these are quite... Uh, the macro uh, indicators, or these are this is what we, we we're reading right now from the macro setup that we are in as a country. So uh, this also spilling into some of these some of these um, companies and uh, inclusive of Delta. Fair enough. That would pretty much form the backdrop. Now, 
to zero in now on on delta we will start by looking at their performance uh, right up to their year end which was the 31st of um, march 2020 their revenue there coming in at 8.4 billion zimbabwe dollars uh, um, increasing uh, by 10 percent and their profit after tax dipping marginally to a billion uh, Zimbabwean dollars and of course one of the key things that have been explained in their financials is the fact that across all their business segments there has been a dip in as far as volumes are concerned can you shed more light where that very development is concerned sure so I think uh, looking at the fundamental aspect of the performance which I think uh, is mainly to do with volumes and also pricing there has been quite some shift there. Volumes actually fell uh, by a double-digit figure for the broader group. And uh, looking at prices, they had to be adjusted in line with inflation. So we're seeing a movement on the top line, which, is, which basically speaks to uh, inflation-induced uh, price adjustment. And then we also see uh, an impact on profitability of adjustments in terms of fair value and also on losses in terms of uh, foreign currency. So yes, their top line grew sharply, but this was mainly a consequence of um, trying to catch up with the increases in costs, which is the cost of production. You would know that uh, Delta imports some of its uh, inputs, uh, which uh, obviously has to be compensated for. So you also have to maintain your margin by actually increasing that price. So yes, in terms of um, performance in, 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 in numbers terms, uh, basically we saw that jump on the top line. But then getting to the bottom line, I think there are quite some number of aspects there. You have fair value adjustments which affect properties, plant, and ETC. These have to move up as the currency falls. But you also have an aspect of the liability which they contain. They have got about 63 million, which is due to uh, their foreign um, uh, liabilities. That is in form of outstanding dividends and also some, some other credits from outside. But this is mainly dividend money. And this money has not been paid for some while. So once you move towards the local currency, and the local currency is uh, moving inverse to the, to, the, to the U.S. dollar, it means you are incurring exchange losses. And so they have had to incur those exchange losses. But I think they have, um, uh, the way that they have structured it is such that government has already committed to pay it, uh, as, I mean, to pay all those outstanding amounts uh, over a, a number of years going forward. So they have put it as, an, as a derivative of sort. And what it does is to cushion the impact of this um, loss in terms of exchange, exchange losses. But broadly, we saw um, a bottom line which, is not really, um, which has not really moved significantly from last year, but a top line which has moved significantly. This is because of these fair value adjustments or fair value losses and also these uh, losses on, 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 on foreign currency dealings. But I think we can uh, basically move in terms of the volumes to say what was uh, possibly the key drivers in terms of some of that volume performance. I think looking at the way Delta is structured is such that it's split within three categories, three main categories, which is basically like a beer or clear beer segment, um, which is almost the, the way the premium, uh, the, the, the premium uh, there's a premium classification in terms of the beer segment. In, in terms of lager and then we've got sorghum beer which is uh, quite at the bottom and we also have um, sparkling beverages and uh, from a historical perspective mainly the lager depart division uh, drives the, 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 the revenue figure because of the high margins that are associated with uh, that cluster and then we get to sorghum beer it mainly drives um, the, vo the, the, the value of money that the company generates but it's also um, you realize less in terms of your margins from driving uh, so Gambia. So it has had an impact in terms of cushioning uh, the decline in revenue, but equally it has not contributed as much to the bottom line. So there's a payoff between driving volumes in so Gambia terms and also losing volumes in terms of lager. You, you might maintain a certain value or certain um, revenue uh, uh, number, but you may not be able to maintain the same profitability because uh, uh, so Gambia has got uh, low margins. So there's been a drastic loss, double-digit loss in terms of um, 
volumes across different units, but more significantly, the lager segment, which has been the mainstay of this um, of, of 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 the institution. But looking at um, at the breakdown in terms of uh, this the, the the income split, I think our chart here shows that. Uh, so Gambia is now the key driver in terms of driving um, volumes. And that is also split into even the revenue contribution as well. But now when we look at the profitability, uh, La Gambia still remains more profitable compared to, 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 to So Gambia. So that's the, the highlight that I meant to put out there. Fair enough. Um, I want us to zero in on um, the Laga business segment performance and looking at just how their volumes have fed um, over the years. The lack of volumes at this very point, they slumped 42% um, to the figure that we're seeing there presented um, in the chart, which is a, about um, a million hectoliters thereabout. But what is um, important to note is the fact that we're coming from a very um, high point there of over 1.8 million hectoliters in, in 2019 jumping there um, from about 1.5 million 1.5 million hectoliters in 2018 and you check the trend over the past 10 years coming from perhaps um, a performance that would um, mirror that would be that one in 2010 where pretty much the volumes were pretty much at a very similar base. We see an upward trajectory between 2010 and 2013 which takes a significant dip between 2013 and 2017 before of course that surge that then is um, cut short in 2020. What do these figures really get to tell us from the chart? Yeah, so that dip represents um, a, a fundamental shift in terms of the economy where the country decides to move from multi-currency uh, to a mono-currency, which is uh, the Zim dollar. So what happens at that point? Because the financial year for Delta runs from um, March uh, to March next year as well. So what, what you then relate to, to Feb in terms of um, the, the, the year and the year and period? So what happens is that um, looking at the, at the point at which the Zim dollar was, uh, was introduced and you get to see the Zim dollar losing value against the USD and incomes not matching this um, loss of value, it meant that affordability became a challenge because companies had to resort to adjusting their prices as well. So prices are increasing, affordability is declining, and people are consuming less and less of these goods. And Obviously, beer is, uh, does not rank high in terms of um, what uh, consumers would prefer as essentials. So you would uh, find lager beer being forgone. Uh, uh, for the, I mean, um, as people try to preserve value, uh, as people try to go for value products, which are products which speak to the little uh, sums of money that they now hold. So this is why we see this drastic uh, decline. But for 2019, which is a year running to... Uh, March of 2019. That's the financial year, right? So most of the 2019 financial year is on the 2018 um, uh, uh, year in terms of our calendar year. So what happens in 2018 is we see this is an election year. There's a lot of expenditure in terms of agri subsidies and there is that artificial oneness to one which is going on in the market and government is actually carrying uh, the weight in terms of trying to uh, maintain this oneness to one so people have got enough spend and they're buying as much in terms of uh, alcohol in terms of all these sorts of things and that's why we then get to see uh, the volume levels in terms of beer uh, going up so in an election year there's a lot of merrymaking there's a lot of activities that are going on and government is also pumping money into uh, different activities especially in terms of agriculture and it spills over to consumption of alcoholic um, uh, uh, items so that's why the 2019 financial year had one of the highest figures in terms of volume consumed but suddenly all those subsidies are gone and uh, values are, or in term incomes are being eroded at a faster pace and 2020 now uh, proves to be a, a very, very difficult year for Delta as volumes fall to a almost 10-year low.
Yeah, but uh, while we're still very much on that, I mean, um, to sort of get a little bit into the outlook or perhaps what we could expect going forward, given what then has played out, um, given the COVID conditions, this, of course, would come post the 31st because the lockdown came in at just right about that time. What can we expect in terms of their um, lager beer segment uh, yeah, I, th I think that's quite important because um, COVID quite changes a, a lot of a lot of things. Most of the beer sales are moved through uh, pubs and um, some of these night uh, spots. Of course, retail plays a lot in terms of also driving volumes. But uh, we suddenly saw a, a, a legislation that banned um, gatherings of um, more than six people or so at some point in closure closure of some of these um, night spots and, 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 and halls where people go to uh, Mary Mac and, and, and consume alcohol. So obviously the pandemic comes with uh, uh, increased levels of challenges for Delta because uh, it simply means that volumes get to fall at a far much faster rate than uh, they were doing just before uh, the financial year end. So I, I think that we are going to see especially for Q1 of 2021, a sharp decline in terms of um, lager volumes from prior year levels. And I think the same story then becomes true of the sorghum beer segment where we see a 25% dip in, in as far as the volumes are concerned. And pretty much you look at the volumes, um, they pretty much mirror what we see play out in as far as the lager beer segment is yeah. concerned. Yeah, but then you would also realize that there is a bit of um, uh, the, the level of decline is not as sharp compared to lager beer. Correct. Um, this is mainly an impact of um, value buying. By value buying, I simply mean consumers basically move towards those goods which preserve their value or which uh, give them value for their money in tough times. So we, we, we're seeing uh, consumers move from high-end products to those low-end products and they can, where, where they can actually derive the same value or the same uh, kind of uh, impact or effect so from Chibuku, consumption. So, so Chibuku becomes a friend. So, so Chibuku becomes a friend. This is why you see a, a, a decline in volumes, but it's, 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 more, it's more fairer. But also... Some of this is mainly to do with inputs. There are some inputs that are demanded in terms of production of sorghum beer, uh, especially in terms of its packaging, which uh, became a constraint last year, and they had to cut in terms of um, they had to cut in terms of their production and so forth. But uh, they are now planning to come back with an increased capacity. They've opened um, more terms of plans and, and demand is beginning to, keep, to pick up again. But this is simply a partially a reflection of uh, the fundamental aspect of uh, value buying. Well, um, thank you, Respect. Um, we're just going to take a, a short break and when we come back, we'll have a look at some of the business segments, including, of course, the sparkling beverages. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back, viewers. We're still discussing the operations of Delta. We've just discussed um, the traditional beer segment, the lager beer, and now we move on to the sparkling uh, beverages segment, as well as other business units that Delta is invested in. And with me in, on set is our very own analyst at Equity Access, Respect Gwenzi. Respect. Now, to move on to the sparkling beverages um, segment there, the volume's taking a 17% deep um, in line with how all the other segments have taken a knock. What do we read from that very segment? This has been a sector which has been uh, most affected. I mean, for quite a long time now, uh, the sector has been really under some strain, especially on demand death and uh, the volumes for successive years have actually been coming off. But part of the challenge with the beverages segment is because um, there have got to be challenges in terms of procuring foreign currency so that the company uh, could um, be able to uh, produce and be able to sell. So uh, this has been one of the key challenges. It's a supply side issue which is mainly driven by the fact that the country is short on foreign currency and the central bank was failing to allocate adequately in terms of uh, foreign currency needs for the company. Uh, but uh, for most of 2020, 
the issue there was uh, the company getting back in terms of production and also trying to claw back a bit of market share and uh, we also saw a bit of um, competition emerging from some players like pepsi and some of these other alternatives so definitely uh, the terrain was a bit changed the the, the, the terrain um, got a bit affected by some of these um, competition issues but uh, you would also agree that looking at demand generally for consumption of beverages of the sort that they produce, they have also been affected uh, by this erosion in terms of uh, uh, value or aggregate demand. So people do not have the uh, liquidity right now. They do not have uh, sufficient cash flows to sustain their consumption levels. And uh, they've been foregoing some of uh, these uh, purchases. And so it's, 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 it's quite economy-wide and uh, it affects especially those goods that Delta actually produce. And uh, sparkling beverages, looking at the historical volumes, um, you, we could, um, we could uh, clearly see uh, that dip in terms, of, uh, in terms of volumes with only the exception of 2018 which partly was uh, influenced by the fact that we're moving towards an election year. But clearly, uh, uh, this sector has struggled for at least over the past six, six, six years. Now, this is a segment where several issues are playing out. Um, among them, or should I say chief of them, would be the issue to do with bottling rights. You mentioned Pepsi, um, and um, which of course would be a competitor in as far as the Coca-Cola brand is concerned. And there have been talks of withdrawal in terms of the bottling rights, which of course has now been uh, uh, resolved Settled, and there's yeah. been an extension where that is concerned. Can you bring our viewers into perspective where that very development is concerned? Yeah, so AB InBev acquired Submiller, which was uh, the world's uh, second biggest uh, producer, uh, but with main operations in sub-Saharan Africa and a part of Europe uh, thereabouts. So they acquired this firm uh, about uh, four years ago, I think around 2016 thereabout. Uh, by acquiring uh, Submiller, they took over uh, the brands and also the subsidiaries that were falling under Submiller. So this is where Delta has been. It was, um, uh, it was, uh, its parent was actually Submiller before acquisition of Submiller by AB InBev. Um, so, so we then see the, how this, the dynamics around this acquisition had to play out in successive years where AB InBev has acquired uh, Submiller and then also Delta. But also, Submiller had rights in terms of uh, Coca-Cola distribution rights. So Coca-Cola now is uh, also um, uh, uh, a subsidiary, or it's one of its major shareholders there is, is also Pepsi, which is then gets to be a competitor in terms of um, uh, the, 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 the AB InBev group. So over the years, Coca-Cola have shown its intention to want to withdraw bottling rights from some of these entities that were owned by SAB Miller. And uh, of late, uh, that difference has been resolved. But I think also AB InBev uh, was quite clear in terms of their focus. They mainly wanted to concentrate on um, alcohol and uh, they could easily have spun it off. And I'm sure uh, they could have been um, uh, clear bids to acquire that. But also looking at the terrain in Zimbabwe, it's not easy to get a suitor under the current, um, uh, I mean, macroeconomic challenges. So it might have also equally inspired uh, some of the extension, um, extension of, those, uh, of those bottling rights to date. Very quickly, how much of an impact is the fact that um, uh, AB InBev now has um, a, a, a plant that is actually producing uh, the Pepsi brands and all those uh, products that fall under that very bracket? Yeah, it has always been its plan. I mean, it has always um, uh, uh, had that plan across Africa, not just only in Zimbabwe. So obviously it gets to affect in terms of strategy, having one investment which then gets to, and you also have uh, competitive rise, and you know that you maximize value by actually focusing on your own product, but you also have insights through these bottling rights. So they get to be conflict there. But I think that um, there has been an amicable resolve uh, towards uh, 
uh, working out that, um, that, 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 that challenge. But I, I also feel that in the long term it works against uh, Coca-Cola because as a competitor to Pepsi, they really uh, want to keep tight their strategy. And also they play significantly in terms of marketing because what you simply acquire are rights to utilize the brands, but they also get to play out significantly in terms of uh, advertisement and so forth. So they will actually be playing the game for you and you get to maximize in terms of, uh, in terms of your margins. So I think that um, it, it plays out in favor of uh, AB InBev to retain uh, the bottling rights with, uh, with, 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 with uh, AB InBev's subsidiary such as Delta. Now respect, um, perhaps on a lighter note, the Zim dollar is plunging against major currencies of the world. Inflation is soaring. I mean, it's, it's flying through the roof. And there are reports that clients are actually holding on to those tenable glass bottles as a store of value. I mean, what does this mean? What's happening there? <laughs> yeah, sure. So that's quite predictable. I think it's, uh, it's economy-wide. You say value depending on your... Um, depending on what you get. So... If you are a multimillionaire uh, sitting with a huge RTGS balances, you'd be looking at acquiring land uh, as a way of preserving value. If you are, uh, you possibly get um, average incomes, you might be looking at also buying stocks uh, as a way of preserving value. But we are now talking of um, a, some of the people out there who do not have is enough or a significant incomes and so they have to hold on to certain assets so yes if you buy um your your your, your bottle of um beverage today uh, obviously it would make more sense if you don't want to utilize the money right away to hold on to the bottle and only dispose once you're sure that uh, immediately as you dispose you're actually buying something or replacing in exchange of something so yes it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean, it preserves value to actually keep uh, your bottles as, uh, as, as bottles other than to simply go and change at a certain uh, Zim dollar <laughs> price. And then two days down the line, that money can no longer buy you the same, the same thing. So yeah, it also, but it then go, gets to cause bottlenecks in terms of production because you want these glasses to be retained you also want to utilize them in future productions and it gets to affect product. But it's quite an, a, 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 a phenomenon which is uh, interesting with respect to our country. Now to hop on to uh, another subsidi a subsidiary, rather, um, National Breweries, the one that is listed on the Lusaka Stock Exchange, their volumes also, um, as though they were in Zimbabwe, um, taking a 27% um, knock. Can you shed light in terms of what's happening with that very unit and uh, how it's performing and also perhaps the situation playing out in Zambia and as far as currency and, and, and issues of such yeah, nature? So, so Zambia has also faced some, some of the similar challenges that we're facing back home, yeah, especially in terms of currency. The currency has lost significant value over the past three years. And uh, there's that continual carnage in terms of uh, the kwacha losing its value against some of the major currencies. Currencies they do have some debt issues with uh, multi um, uh, some of the international financial institutions, and uh, it really meant to push. I mean, production down in terms of what they produce uh, annually. So they've really had their fair share of challenges: inflation going up, currency weaknesses. And uh, this is why we then get to see consumers uh, getting or preferring some opaque uh, products which may not necessarily be legal in terms of, um, in terms of how they got to come into the basically grey imports. So there's been intense competition coming mainly from grey imports and also from some substitute from within Zambia uh, that are not um, really legit or meant to be sold. So this is where most of the pressure is emanating from. So we're seeing erosion of value due to currency weaknesses and also intense competition coming from grey imports as well as um, issues to do with just the proliferation of these uh, illegal products coming to the market. So uh, Delta is still uh, reconfiguring the operation, but um, over the long term, I think that it's really something that's worth uh, considering. 
I think that uh, traditional beer is, is, is really part of our African tradition and it will continue to be part of our um, uh, share of, um, of drinks that we, we, we get to enjoy. Uh, I think that's why as well we're seeing this new acquisition in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the United Nations uh, United Nation, yes. Nation breweries yes, in, in, in South Africa. So that's, that's in that same light. And how important would be that acquisition there? It's quite important. If you look at the GDP of Johannesburg, it's quite significant. It's bigger than almost uh, three over four of uh, all the uh, uh, other African economies in terms of what they produce. Uh, it's in excess of uh, 100 billion. Actually, they're sitting at almost 200 billion in terms of GDP, just the Houghton province. And if you look at this UBM acquisition, it really covers a significant portion of, 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 of Johannesburg. So this is an operation that is possibly entirely uh, bigger or maybe to even the same level as the current Delta operation. So I think it's quite significant as an investment. And also looking at um, uh, diversification, I think it, it really um, diversifies Delta's incomes from Zimbabwe, looking at how this economy has been so volatile and compared to South Africa, which is one of the most stable regions in the in the in the in the in the, in the sub-Saharan Africa region, I think it's really a way of diversifying incomes, and it might help the company really going forward. Now, with respect to move on to um, one of their um, units, or should I say, investment vehicles after Zimbabwe's leading um, liquor producer, um, there have been issues to do with foreign currency coming in the way of some of their supplies and uh, a bit of competition. What, what is your assessment of what has been playing out in that very unit? Yes, yeah, so Aftis is, uh, is, uh, is basically an associate of Delta. And uh, recently, they increased uh, the shareholding in, in Aftis Delta. I mean, Delta actually increased its shareholding in Aftis. They had to buy out Distel's share in, in, in that respective investment. So they're now the majority shareholder, almost close to 50% thereabout. Um, but then looking at the operation, uh, it's twofold. They manufacture their own brands in terms of... Um, a lot of alcoholic uh, drinks, um, but they also get to be in the distributorship of some of the uh, world acclaimed brands. They do a whole lot of distribution around these key brands. So obviously to be able to distribute, you need to import. So they've had to face the challenge of having uh, to commit uh, huge sums of money to import. It, it leaves them at the pleasure of RBZ to be able to play in that market. So I think this has been one of the key challenges and also servicing routes to markets because you do have to do a lot of distributorship. It also means that you, you, you really have to have fuel and uh, looking at the erratic supplies, it really affected that side of the business. But they have been holding forth. There are some of their value brands which are actually picking up uh, cushioning the downside that's associated with some of these challenges that we're mentioning. But it's really tough as well. And looking at their cider operations, um, cider gets to be a prim premium drinks and just like Delta, the Delta's lager beer segment, they also get to be at the brand of a tight economy, but they're, they're, they're holding for it. I have no doubt that it is one of uh, the good investments that we still find in our, in, our, in our local market. Lastly, just before we go, respect, there is the issue to do with the legacy debt. And um, there is a figure of $60 million. $10 million of that has been paid by RBZ. And as far as the <coughs> managers are concerned, um, what is your assessment of that very development there? And do we have time frames? What can we expect? Yeah, it's, uh, it all, it's, it's all in the hands of RBZ. So, yeah, we, we do have to wait and see what uh, happens in terms of the macro side. It's really dependent on how the country gets to stabilize. Thank you, respect. Thank you, viewers, for staying with us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and to visit our informative website, www.equityaccess.net. From Ibn Mabunda and the Equity Access team, don't forget to join us every Tuesday, Thursday, 7 p.m. Central African time on this very platform. From the Equity Access team, Dangi and ciao.